Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lucy Blanco. I am the city clerk for the city of Simi Valley. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to our 2021 Redist redistricting workshop. Um, also here on our, our panel is uh, Tema Kusana from the city clerk department, um, Angelica Aguirre, and then um, David Yoshitomi. I'd like to take the time um, to thank you all for, for your interest and in joining us today. Uh, this workshop today is going to be uh, to discuss the communities of interest here in the, the city of Simi Valley. And also um, we will be talking about introducing our mapping tool, paper maps and assisting the public on drawing, drawing your district maps. Um, I would like you uh, to introduce Kristen Park. She's, from our, she's our consultant from National Demographics Corporation and she will be providing you a presentation and will also be available for any questions for, for the public or anyone to ask. Uh, so Kristen, I'll go ahead and leave it to, to you to start your presentation. Thank you could. so much. Sorry, just one moment. If you are here yes. for uh, Spanish oh, translation, um, yes. we please select the interpretation feature down at the bottom um, and select your language, either English or Spanish, and that will allow you to hear the um, the presentation in the language of your choice. Thank you. Thank you, David. Wonderful. So uh, as David just mentioned, we do have live translation in Spanish. So you'll click on the interpretation button if you would like to listen instead of hearing this in English in Spanish. So as Lucy said, my name is Kristen Parks. I'm a consultant with National Demographics Corporation and we are the firm hired by the city of Simi Valley to assist with the redistricting process. And today I'm gonna to give an overview of how this process works, what our timeline is, and most importantly, how members of the public can participate. Uh, and we are hoping that anyone tuning in today at, uh, will engage with this process, share your feedback, and perhaps even submit maps to be considered by the council. So I'm going to share my screen. I do have a short PowerPoint and then I will um, also show you the website and take questions. There's also a Q&A uh, box on Zoom. And so you're welcome to type your questions into the Q&A box uh, as well. If, uh, and we'll do our best to answer those and review them. Or when I finish my presentation, you can use the raise hand feature and we'll uh, unmute you or promote you to panelists uh, if you would like to ask a question that way. So those of you who are in the city of Simi Valley right now may remember that very recently the city transitioned from at-large elections to district-based elections for the city council. And uh, the reason for this is that a, that a lot of cities in California changed is because there were lawsuits or threats of lawsuits against cities that elected council members at large. What that means is everyone in the city had the opportunity to vote on every council member. So Simi Valley made that switch to district elections just in 2018. And so four districts were created. There are four council members, one elected from each district, and the council members also have to live within that district. So this provides for representation on a more local geographic basis. Um, what's interesting about the timing here is that Simi Valley switched to districts and then had their first by districts elections, so you may recall, in 2020. And that in 2020, districts one and three were up for that election. Well, before districts two and four are even having by district elections for the first time, we are in 2022 having to reevaluate that map, right? Because every 10 years there's a census, and every 10 years we have to reevaluate the map. So here is the current map. And although it was adopted in 2018, these four districts that we were talking about, it was adopted using uh, population numbers from the previous census, so 2010. 
So what our task is now, what our redistricting task is, is to reevaluate these district boundaries in light of the 2020 census. And since there's been a little bit of time for the public to engage with, with this process, um, we're really hoping to hear from you. And even if you want to come and, and let us know you like these boundaries the way they are, or you know, you don't know what district you're in and you want to find out that those are all things we can help with. So despite uh, the delays in the US Census Bureau processing data this year, um, we do finally have official population numbers. These have also been adjusted by the state of California. And so in the city of Simi Valley, in 2020, the census counted 126,360 people. So you can see the breakdown of population for each of the four districts that were adopted in 2018. Those are the current districts. And you can see that we are looking for an ideal district size. What that means is that each district, we want it to be pretty equal to every other district uh, so that each council member is representing about the same number of people. Uh, so we're looking for, if you take the total population, 126,360, and you divide it by four, you're gonna get that ideal population size for each district of 31,590 people. Now, you know that none, you can see here, none of these districts are exactly 31,590 people. So under the total population row, you'll see a deviation from ideal row. And that tells us whether these districts have more or fewer than that ideal size. So those districts that have a negative number in the deviation, so uh, that's two, three, and four, that means they're slightly underpopulated relative to the ideal number. So even though this is, this is technical stuff and it's numbers, um, the good news is you, you don't have to stress too much about these numbers because the number that is looking very good for Simi Valley is the number that's in green, and that's the total deviation. The total deviation across these four districts in terms of population is just under 4%, 3.76%. What that means is these districts are already pretty well balanced population wise, meaning they're pretty equal. We are operating in a, in a legal regime where uh, the federal government says that this total deviation should be under 10%. So in terms of constitutionality and legal compliance, Simi Valley's current district map does meet those guidelines for population balance. So that is a very good starting point. What that suggests to me as your consultant is that if you are going to make adjustments to these district boundaries, um, you probably want to try, you know, not move too much population because it's already quite balanced. So that being said, when we, when we look at these district boundaries, we do have to, by law, consider certain criteria and not just the population equality that I just mentioned. We also have to make sure we're thinking about the Federal Voting Rights Act to ensure that we're not moving the boundaries in any way that would dilute the, the voting power of protected classes of voters. That is a Federal Voting Rights Act consideration. And while we do look at racial and ethnic data on our map, and we will produce reports for each council district, uh, on race and ethnicity and citizen voting age population, we can't only look at race and ethnicity when we're drawing district boundaries because that's considered racial gerrymandering and that is prohibited under federal law. One thing that's new about this year is that California has passed a law telling us 
that every city has to consider certain criteria when they look at their district boundaries. And those criteria are listed in order that they must be considered. So this is a rank ordered list. That's the middle column here in yellow. So many of these things on this list are things that Simi Valley considered and talked about in 2018 when the original districts were adopted. However, what's new about this law is that it puts them in a certain order, right? So the first thing that's important is that each district is contiguous, which simply means each district should be one whole piece and shouldn't have any disconnected separate pieces. So all each district has to be one piece that's connected to itself. The second criterion is to whenever we can not divide up neighborhoods or communities of interest into different council districts. Unless of course those neighborhoods or communities wish to be divided up. So that is something that we rely on the public to come forward and make comment and submit emails and testimony on um, if they have, if, if you're in a neighborhood or if you're in a community and the current district boundaries divide it and you would prefer that that community be in one council district, we need to hear from you in this process. The third thing on the list is just to create easily identifiable boundaries. And we do that by drawing our lines along familiar uh, dividing boundaries and borders, things like major roads that most people are going to be familiar with. The last criterion is to maintain compactness. Um, and compactness is just for the purpose of this law defined as when you're drawing district boundaries, not to bypass a nearby population that might naturally be part of that district and instead draw your boundaries farther away to take in a different group of people. There may be situations in which that is legally permissible, perhaps if we're complying with the Federal Voting Rights Act, or we are trying to keep together communities of interest, something like that. But in general, we want to avoid those strange shaped districts. Finally, we don't want to favor or discriminate against the political party. Um, that's important because these city elections in the state of California are nonpartisan, meaning that, that they are not party driven. Um, there are other things we can talk about in this other goals column, but really that's just there to make sure that everyone's aware that even though we're following these legal criteria, they're not the only things that we can look at. There is more that we can take into account when we are evaluating any proposed changes to the district boundaries. However, we first have to make sure we've addressed federal and state law. So we talked about the second criterion in California law that we have to think about is to try to minimize dividing neighborhoods and communities of interest. Most people are familiar with what the concept of a neighborhood is. However, we know that the term neighborhood doesn't account for all of our types of communities within the city. So this is why the state law has another category. It says neighborhoods and communities of interest. And a community of interest is defined in the state law as a group of people that is sharing things in common, sharing interests in common. These can be social or economic interests. And this is a group of people that wants to be in one city council district so that they have a chance to be fairly and effectively represented on the council. So the way that you can think about a community of interest is you can think about um, what are the things that bring people together in your community? And particularly you can think of maybe what are some of the concerns that your community has or issues that you might want to bring forward to the city council. Um, you can define your community as um, a group of people that live around a certain park or school or experience certain um, impacts from traffic or construction or uh, people who share the same language 
that they speak perhaps and live in a concentrated area. There's really no wrong way for you to define a community of interest. And this is, this is a factor that, that will be considered when we look at any proposed new district maps or changes to the current map. Uh, one of the questions that will always come up is, well, how do these proposed districts affect the communities of interest that we've heard from? What's important is that we hear from the public and we hear from the residents of Simi Valley because as a consultant, it's, it's not my job to come in and tell you what you know, what you know about your own neighborhood or your own community, uh, but uh, we are here to listen uh, and to document all of that because every part of this process is documented and entered into the public rep record. It is a fully transparent process. So we encourage you to make those public comments. So I, I can show you some of the demographic data um, on a map of the city. What I will have up for you um, this coming week on the website is an interactive map where you can zoom in and out and look at this sort of data yourself on your own browser. Um, so that, you know, while I'm showing you a slide, uh, I know because you can't zoom in and out that it may not be super helpful to you, but this is just so you get an idea of what is available in terms of the data that we received from the Census Bureau. CVAP is a term that you'll hear. It just stands for citizen voting age population. So particularly when we're thinking about the Voting Rights Act, we want to look at where do voters or citizens of voting age, so over 18, of different race and ethnic groups, where do they live? So the way we show this usually on a map is a heat map, right, that goes from the purple and blue areas that have zero up to 25% Latino or whichever group we're looking at, all the way to the yellow and red, which are actually census blocks that have higher percentages of Latino citizens of voting age. So we can look at Latinos. Um, we can look at other groups as well. I haven't included everything here because I don't want to talk at you for too long today. Well, we can look at where there are single family homes versus multifamily housing. This can give us an approximation of the density of our communities. We can look at where families live that have children under age 18. So these are sort of our school age kids. Where do they live in our city? Um, and you can also see on this map the little red um, icons. I don't know if you can see it. Those are the schools, right? And the little tree is a park. And then I think there's some other stuff on there. But um, all of this can be very helpful to the public when they're trying to think about, well, what are the features of my neighborhood or my community? Where are we? And why do we want to be kept together in one council district if, if they, if you do. So once you start thinking through these things, um, we have already made available for you on the website, redistrictsimivalley.org, and um, available to pick up as well at the public library or city hall, uh, these paper maps that you can actually go ahead and draw your own council districts directly on the map. I always tell people the best way to do this is to use different colored highlighters so you can highlight. Um, or I don't know, I have erasable colored pencils, whatever you wanna do, you can draw your own districts directly on paper here. Um, this is the most simple way for you to draw a map. We will have additional uh, mapping tools available to you on that website in the coming weeks, but uh, for those of you who want to get started now, which I absolutely encourage you to do, you can draw on the paper map. What you see here are population units or pieces of the city um, divided up. These ones here that you see, I think, are based on census block groups. So 
these are not lines that we've drawn in any way intentionally. They're coming from the Census Bureau geography. But what you see is a number representing the number of people in that population unit area. Well, if you recall, when I talked about uh, equal population across four districts, we got this 31,590 number. That's our ideal size. So what you can do is pull out your phone, your calculator, even on the back of the sheet, you can add up the numbers. Um, so when you draw your, your district, it'll be a group of these population units and uh, you can add it up and try to keep it close to 31,590. Now, I'm also in the process of making this paper map even more user-friendly. So in a couple of days, you'll see an even more user-friendly version of it um, that, that actually labels some of the roads because that can be helpful to see what, what the name of the major roads are, um, as well as we have a version of this map that instead of showing you the total population, instead gives you an ID number and you can cross-reference that ID number with an Excel spreadsheet. So that will also be posted onto the website. I'll show you where all of these tools will live online. Um, but at the end of the day, if you want to just send an email or speak at a public meeting or even draw a district on an, you know, a napkin or a piece of scrap paper and submit that, those are all, there's any way that you want to bring your feedback to this process. We welcome it and we will bring it to this, the council for consideration. So um, there's also an advanced online mapping tool for anyone who's really fired up about redistricting. Um, and the reason we make this available to the public is really for transparency reasons, because we wanna empower the public with the same tools that, that I'm using as your demographer when I'm drawing maps. So. This tool is not yet available, it's being updated um, because in the state of California, we just on September 27th got our adjusted census numbers. Those are the numbers that by law in the state of California we have to use. So the software is being updated um, and it will, uh, it will launch soon. We'll have tutorial videos and I do also have a step-by-step -step PDF for how to use uh, Maptitude, which is which is this um, tool. If if you have participated in the districting process in 2018, this tool was available to residents of Simi Valley. So uh, if you used it, then you might remember it could be kind of frustrating, but it's very powerful, and there's a lot that you can do with it if you have the time to put in. Um, a lot of us don't have that time. That's why the paper maps, you know, even as someone who's, you know, a demographer, I still love paper maps, particularly if they're, um, you know, designed in such a way that you can actually see what's on them, right? And that's where I'm working to improve what I just showed you. So here we are in our timeline, just to put this in context, um, the city of Simi Valley has until April 17th, legally, to adopt the council district boundaries for the next 10 years. So that will take us until the, after the next census in 2030. So required by law, the city must hold four public hearings uh, prior to adopting the boundaries for the next 10 years. And so the city has already held the first public hearing and where we are today is, is just a workshop. So this is more informal. And I, I see we already have people typing in questions, which is great. Um, there will be two more hearings this year in 2021. And then we will have uh, an, another hearing in January where hopefully the council will be able to actually adopt the, the district boundaries. Um, and get, get that done quickly before the deadline. So this is, this is good to see. The reason we have that April deadline is because 
2022 is an election year and the city will be holding elections in November of 2022. So we wanna make sure everyone, all voters know which district that they're in, all candidates know which district that they're in and the county registrar knows what precincts the voters are in. So this may feel like a slightly rushed process um, and that's because relative to the way it was done 10 years ago, it, it is relatively rushed but that is because the federal government had such a long delay in releasing census data. Normally we would have had census data released from the federal government to the states um, at the end of March. And as you can see on this timeline, that didn't happen until August. So that, that set us back significantly, um, which is why if you are tuning in here as a member of the public, even if you're, you know, re-watching this later online, uh, we want you to tell your neighbors that it's happening. We want you to reach out to the community organizations and leaders that you know, so that there can be as much public input in this process as possible. And um, I'm going to go ahead and show you the website. And then there's also a designated specific email for redistricting that you can send um, comments and feedback too. So here is Redistrict Steaming Valley, this website here. Um, there's a lot of good information here. Most of what I covered in my presentation will also be on the website. Also, all of the PowerPoints and staff reports and meeting minutes will live on the schedule page. And they actually have to live here on this website for 10 years. That's another requirement from the state. So all of this is here. Um, and so there's that, you can see the schedule as well. Once we start considering specific proposed maps, they will appear on this draft map page. And all of the mapping tools that I mentioned will be on draw a map. So you can already see um, these initial paper maps linked here. They're linking to PDFs. You can print it out at home or you can actually open the PDF and draw on your computer with it. So all the tools will come be posted here. Um, and if you want to view this website in any other language, of course, you can select the language at the top. So I'm going to um, stop my screen share so that I can open these questions that I see. Is that, Lucy, does that sound good? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you, Kristen. All right. Okay, so first question is regarding population data. Uh, do we have a breakout of only US citizens since only US citizens are legally able to vote? Um, and yeah, the answer to that question is yes, we do have citizen voting age population. Um, and as you might recall, that was, that was sort of a point of controversy about the census. Were they gonna ask about citizenship? And uh, they, they actually decided no, that they weren't. However, we do have that data from a survey that the US Census does every year called the American Community Survey where they do ask that question. So that is how we're getting that. We also on the back end, um, and I can post this on the website, we also have uh, some voter registration data that's broken down um, into different race, race, racial and ethnic groups. Um, so there's a lot of data <laughs> that we can play with. However, by law with redistricting, when we're talking about the total population of each district, we're actually talking about everyone, right? Even 16 year olds, even newborn babies, um, everyone. The only people that we're not talking about uh, in the state of California are incarcerated persons who are in state or federal prison. So, um, well, if there is a prison in the jurisdiction. So Simi Valley probably got some prisoners counted that had a Simi Valley address, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was like under, it was fewer than 10, right? So I, I, I presented that to city council recently, but uh, point being, we do have to count everyone and we are required by law to, to use the total population, not just the citizen population, at least when 
uh, determining the total population of each district. And then that person, another comment on that same thing. And then a question from Daniel saying, how do the new census numbers compare to previous numbers? And what is the percentage shift for each district? Um, I actually can pull up the 2010 numbers, um, but I will preface it by, because I don't know off the top of my head, by saying that we, California, a lot of communities in California did not grow as much as we anticipated that we would. Um, and so the numbers, while there is growth in most communities, um, across California, it's not as much growth as we expected. So pulling up Simi Valley, and I'll actually share my screen uh, again so I can show you this demographic data. I don't think I put it in a PDF yet, but here it is. All right, so I know you can't quite see this, but um, when you, uh, and I'll post this on the website in PDF, but we're looking at for 2020, a total population of 126,360. Um, and somewhere in this spreadsheet, if I can move it, um, I also have the 2010 numbers which I think are over here. Yes, so 2010 was 125,490. So that's a very small rate of growth for Simi Valley. Um, those 2010 numbers, wait, nope, 2010, 2010. is 124,231, right? So we go from 124,231 in 2010, with that census to the 2020 number of 126,356. So uh, that's, a, that's a small rate of growth, but there is growth. Um, and if you do wanna see that growth by district, um, I can also produce that report for you. In general, what we're focusing on are the 2020 numbers because those are the numbers we're required to look at um, by, by law. So those are the things I see in the Q&A box, but I do see we have a, a hand raised as well. Um, Daniel, you can go ahead and speak, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes this is uh, in regard to the question that I just asked. What I'm trying to determine is whether there's any significant shift between the Did we just lose his sound? Daniel, it looks like we lost your audio. Oh. We hear you now. Okay. I'm trying to determine the extent of the shift in populations in the districts between 2010 and 2020, if it's a very tiny percentage, and if the uh, percentages within each district in 2010 are similar to what we have now in 2020, that's a strong argument for not making any changes in the current boundaries, which is uh, at the just on the surface to me looks like it's the case. So my preliminary impression from all of this is that there's probably no reason for us to change our boundaries. And of course, uh, maintaining the current boundaries would eliminate the problem uh, of the few voters that we shifted from one district to another, uh, either not being able to vote in two consecutive elections or being able to vote in two consecutive elections for council members. So um, 
I'd like to get that information. Uh, obviously, it doesn't have to be this minute, but I think that's important information for making a decision. Um, and uh, uh, I, I also want to compliment you on, on the, the scope of your effort and information you're providing, um, even though it might turn out to be totally superfluous if it, if it seems obvious that we should just maintain the status quo. Thank you for those comments. And you're absolutely correct that given this, what looks to be a very small change in population um, and the fact that the current districts do reflect uh, population balance or population equality, it, it, as a consultant, it is something that I am able to recommend is that the city actually considers the current map alongside any changes that may be uh, proposed by council members or members of the community. Um, but, to, but to not throw out, we're not throwing out the old map. Um, it can be considered side by side with anything new that, that um, is brought to the table. So you're correct in that, in that regard and thank you. Are there other questions? I, I think I uh, just lost my audio on this. Um, I don't know if you can hear me or not. We can. Uh, I, I can't hear you at the moment. <laughs> so I, I will lower my hand for the moment. Thank you. Kristen, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. So Lucy, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, well, I think that um, Kristen, or I know that we, the workshop is uh, scheduled till two o'clock, till four o'clock. So, but does that mean we uh, stay online, or do we, uh, in case anyone no. else wants to show up? <laughs> um, Usually, is there anyone else? Yeah. If there's any other questions, anyone, we are question? more than happy. There anyone is um, one question in the Q and A. If you can see that, it just came through. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so someone says, if we want to recommend that the map stay the same, what method should we use to communicate that? Um, and thank you, David, for catching that because it's a wonderful question. Um, I suggest that you, you send an email um, to, to redistrict at simivalley.org, or you can um, attend any of the upcoming meetings and make a public comment, um, or you can, you know, email your council members uh, and let them know as well. So any way that you want to convey that, um, that also will, will be a consideration that the council will consider. Do we have any other questions from any of the attendees? No more questions. Looks like that's it. No hands raised, well, no more in the Q&A. Thank you. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank everyone who, all the attendees who, um, who took the time to be here to participate and to show their interest and to voice, voice their, their, their concerns and their wishes. So as um, Karen, uh, as um, Kristen indicated, if you, um, whatever your wishes may be, uh, please feel free to email us at redistrict at Simi Valley. Dot org or as you said bring please come to one of our public hearings we have three more and um, you can state your your uh, what you wish the map to remain or if you would, would like changes so um, I really don't have anything else Kristen if you uh, you'll have everything on the website for um, the public to to view um, there's a lot of valuable information and also questions and uh, answers there as well Yes, everyone have a great rest of their Saturday. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ludis and your staff.